Don't just look for the money. Don't go, oh, I'll make so much money selling this product. What you do matters, uh, to quote Brene Brown, but who you are matters more. Thinking, wow, there's seven reasons people buy anything. We have to be able to do everything Alexa can't do. In sales, uh -huh. no never means no. Wherever you're at today, I want you to think deeply about the question I'm going to ask you. So if you're about to pick up the phone to call a prospect, if you've got an important board meeting to really uh, get the decision makers on board to your solution, if you've got, you know, if you're in the gym thinking about how you're going to structure your prospecting day, if you're driving down the car to your next, you know, driving down the road to your next appointment, wherever you're at right now, take a second and think about this. Have you ever wondered and really wondered like what it actually takes. What are some things that you have to do if you want to be a top 1% salesperson in your industry? Here's what I'm talking about. The salesperson who makes all of the money. You know what I'm talking about. They get any promotion they want. In fact, they turn down most promotions that they don't want. They have all respect from the owners and other organizational heads in their company. They're the salesperson that everybody looks at as a leader and they lead by example. If you've ever wondered how to do that, my next guest is going to answer that question for you. And let me give you a small taste of her background. She is, and I, I must say after watching her on YouTube for quite a while, very energetic, wickedly funny, who helps sales team, a guru who helps sales teams bridge the gap between beating quota and selling with an authentic heartfelt approach. Very important in our day and age. As founder of her self-named highly respected company, she's helped create over $1 billion in increased revenue for companies in over 40 countries. She is the best-selling author of Heart and Sell, 10 Universal Truths Every Salesperson Needs to Know, which we're going to talk about that today. It's now translated in four languages. And she's a contributor to Forbes CEO Magazine, Quotable Inc. Magazine, and the Huffington Post. She's been recognized as one of the top 38 Most Dynamic Women in Sales in 2019 by Sales Hacker, the top 10 voices in sales for LinkedIn in 2018, top 20 sales experts appearing in the documentary film, The Story of Sales, top 35 Most Influential Women in Sales, top 35 sales authors for her book, Heart and Sell. I'm going to keep going here. Number one thought leader of the 2019 for Girls Club, top 50 keynote speakers. That's huge. It's hard to get into that. Best Businesses in 2019. Additionally, she's a guest lecturer at Harvard Extension Programs, an advisory board member, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, of Vingresso, the largest digital transformation company, an advisory board member of the prestigious Sundance Institute in Utah. I went to college there. We'll have to talk about that. And she was chosen as the first agent professor at the University of Utah David Eccles School of Business to teach a course in sales. She lives in beautiful Park City. I've been there a gazillion times, one of my favorite cities. And when she's not creating killer content and presenting at sales kickoff, she enjoys skiing, rock climbing, reading, and especially standing on her head. We're going to ask her about that. That gives you a little insight into her fun, playful personality. Please welcome to the show the one and only Sherry Levitine. How are you, Sherry? I'm well, Jeremy. How are you today? And anybody that lives in Park City or Utah, because I went to school down in Utah Valley State University, has to be a friend of mine. How's Park City? You're a skier and an outdoor guy, I can tell. I, you know, here and there, here and there. It's, it's been a while. I live in Missouri now, but I love Utah. So let's, let's jump right into this because, um, I lo you know, I love, this show's all about human behavior and sales leaderships. And I love talking to experts who understand the game, who really understand how selling has changed, how to use techniques that work with human behavior, whereas most salespeople have been taught to use techniques that actually work against human behavior. We'll talk about that. So let's dive right into your story. And I want to give our listeners, let's say, a feel for your background and really how you've gotten to this point where you're one of the elite authorities. I just read off all those accolades on sales and persuasion. Can you tell us a little bit more about your background? How this got started for you? How did you learn all these skills? Oh, well, I mean, I started in the industry that is probably the, 
the, the type of salesperson I was, I would be the one on the airplane when people would say, what do you do? They yeah. would back away five steps from me. So um, I started back in 1980 in the timeshare industry. Okay. And um, very quickly, it felt extremely high pressure to me. So I got out, decided I'd go back to the school. But then a friend called me and said, Marriott has gotten into timeshare. Now, I loved sales. Sure. I loved selling vacations. I loved putting people on vacation. I just didn't like a lot of these companies and how they pressured customers. And right. it was just felt icky to me and not something sure. I wanted to be involved in. But when I heard Marriott had gotten in this company that yeah. is world renowned, yeah. um, I said, yes, I got a job there. And that's when I met the man who would become my mentor. Okay. Because the truth is, at the very beginning, um, and this is important for your audience, I was not born a great salesperson. I always loved people, but I didn't understand why customers buy. I didn't understand the psychology of human behavior. Sure. And I quickly learned through my mentor that better people, better communicators make better salespeople. Perfect. And that it's a life skill, right? Yeah. And I became a student in sales. I remember he told me, yeah. um, keep a little black book. My book is now red. Um, okay. And write down patterns that you see in human behaviors. And I started thinking, wow, there's seven reasons people buy anything. There's only six objections to purchasing anything. And I, I need things, I like to find patterns and I need yeah. things sort of um, articulated into what I call distinctions. Yeah. And I started writing these down and pretty soon I have a theater background. Um, my, I became the number one salesperson, uh, not only at my site, but in all of Marriott, I think for two reasons. Number one, I had this phenomenal mentor and after each deal, whether they bought or didn't buy, yeah. he always said to me, you can lose the deal, but don't lose the lesson. And we looked at what could I have done better? What can I learn? And I think number two, um, it was just my absolute passion um, to learn more. And I did not ascribe to the belief, I was in a one call close environment. I did not ascribe to the belief that if they don't buy today, they'll never buy. Yeah. And so what I did is I would actually call people back. I would get back with them. Yeah. And pretty soon I became a legend in Marriott. I became the top salesperson uh, they ever had. And then uh, built my company in 1997. We went global. Uh, in four years, and um, you know, pretty soon we had customers all over the world, and then yeah. pivoted into many other verticals. Yeah, and I, I think you said some very interesting things. You, you talked about when you first got into sales, selling wasn't something that you were born with, right? And that's true for anybody, really. Like selling is not something you're born with. People think that oh, great salespeople are just great talkers, but nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, the more you talk, the more great you're at talking. Typically, we find in our data that well, you're not as successful at selling. The best salespeople are the best at listening. They're the best at asking the right questions at the right time in the conversation that help the prospect uncover problems in their own mind that they might not have even thought they had, right? Because how many prospects when we talk to them actually know they have a problem? Very few, maybe 10%. Yeah, that's so true. And, and I think that's one thing I learned from this background, right? And now is we're talking to people in financial services, network marketing, even B2B, you know, people selling software. Yeah. You know, it's easy when somebody calls you and they're looking for your solution. Then you, all you need to do is differentiate yourself. Sure. But when you need to create that need. Yeah. You've got to get into the heart and soul and emotions yeah. of that customer and see what matters to them most. And, and we've created a technology to do that. And it's very difficult. Yeah, people. we're, we're going to talk about that. And we, you know, we, we, we call those people problem finders. So you, in our day and age, you have to be really the best at problem finding, not even problem solving. We've all read in sales literature and books, you have to be a great problem finder. And that matters to your success. But now in our age, with information that is abundant and easy to find, um, it's a lot easier for people to solve their problems without the salesperson sometimes, depending on what you're selling, right? So now you have to become even a better at a pro as a problem finder. And that means asking the right questions that help the person uncover problems that they might not have even thought they had. Or maybe they knew about a problem, but they didn't really know how bad the problem was or how bad it could be. Or what are the potential consequences if they don't solve it now instead of down the road? So now you have to be better at problem finding. And we find that most salespeople, especially when I was in my career, most salespeople are trying to be what? Product pushers. 
That's what they're called, product pushers. We call them product pushers. They're trying to ask a few generic logical-based questions. Uh, John, can you tell us what keeps you up at night? Blah, boring, doesn't work anymore. Too, too old school. And then they start talking about their features and benefits and how they have the best this and the best that. And that's like taking a bucket of mud you know, throwing it up against the wall, hoping and praying that something we're going to say is going to trigger that person to magically want to buy from us. It's called and, premature demonstration syndrome, Jeremy. And I'm, we're going to talk about that because yeah. it's one question I was going to ask you, but I call it hopium. It's a drug that so yeah. many salespeople yeah. are on where they hope and pray something they're going to say is going to trigger that person to want to buy. Now that leads me into the next question I'm going to ask you. How come, because I was reading on your website, you talk a little bit about this on some different um, YouTube videos. How come one salesperson can make, let's say, 300000 in a year in that industry, while another is barely getting by when they're using the same quote unquote system? Well, yeah, and this is really the, the thesis of my book is that what you do matters, uh, to quote Brene Brown, but who you are matters more. Okay. So when we talk about heart and cell, there are the 10 universal truths every salesperson needs to know. And five of them are very tactical and they cover what you just said. We have a methodology of questions that I'd love to share with you in just a moment. But, yeah. you know, how we ask questions, how we isolate objections, how we build rapport. Yeah. Um, and, and those things matter. They're tactics, they're skill sets. Sure. But who you are matters more. And again, you mentioned it. It's particularly true today. This authenticity has never been more important. Yeah. And the who you are means, do you have a growth mindset? Mm -hmm. um, are you genuinely curious? Do you take yeah. responsibility? Um, do you have resilience? Do you have positivity? I call it constructive yeah. delusion. Maybe we can get into that a little bit. I like but, that. But there, there, again, that... If I ask a certain set of questions, so if you use our methodology to ask first, second, and third level questions, sure. then, and you ask them and somebody else asks them, if that somebody else yeah. isn't genuinely curious, yeah. if they're not genuinely empathetic, the customer's going to know. It's going to sound and robotic, that, right? It's going to sound it, like a script. Well, and it's particularly true virtually. Yeah. So now everything we're doing is virtual. We're teaching our customers how to go virtual. And yeah. All those mistakes that we made live are even more pronounced in a virtual setting. I, I agree. You know, and like I said, we always, we've been talking a, a lot about this in the train lately that, you know, in times of, uh, let's say, economic expansion, you know, sometimes it's easier to get lazy to sell when things are going well. But in times of economic contraction that we're entering into right now, where companies are cutting budgets, people are holding on to their money a little bit more, they're more cautious or more skeptical than ever. Any shortcoming you have as a salesperson, like you mentioned, especially in a virtual setting, is only going to be magnified and will only result in, in losing really lost sales for you and your company. So you have, to, you have to really put in a lot more time into learning the right training and the right skill sets to ask. And it's not just how you, it's not just the questions you're asking, it's how you're asking them. Right. It's, are they conversational? Are they authentic? You know, we like to teach like, let's say your favorite movie in Hollywood is a George Clooney film, right? And George Clooney plays this character and he talks and he talks. Well, everything George is saying in that film is scripted. But when you're watching it, does it sound scripted? No, Absolutely. it sounds authentic. It sounds like he is the character he's portraying. And selling is the same way. You might know exactly most of the questions you're going to ask in that conversation, but you have to pause a little bit more. You have to think like you're, you're thinking about the next question you're going to ask to make it come out like it's real, like it's authentic. You have to, like you said, be curious to see, I'm not here to make a sale. I'm instead here in your mind, focused on whether there's a sale to even be made in the first place. And when you start to focus on what they're looking for and to see if you can help them, comes across completely different. So I agree with you 100%. I love that. Now, here's what I want to ask you. And I ask this to everybody, if you were starting over today as just a salesperson, forget your great training company you have, what steps would you take to be at the very top in the sales world right now? What would you Jeremy, do? I love this because you know, you gave me 10 scripted, just talking about scripted questions, and now you're not using any of them. There you go. I, know. <laughs> I told so, you, so put you on your toes here. We have an, an authentic podcast. Um, so your question, if I understand it correctly, is if I was starting over now after yeah. being in business 30 years, 
What would I do differently? Let's say you're a salesperson. You don't have your training company. You're like, ah, oh, I'm done with my training company. I'm just going to sell. What would you do? Like, what would you, st what steps would you take to be at the very top of what you're selling? I would say three things are going to be critical for any brand new seller. Number one, pick a product that you believe in and that you're passionate about, because it doesn't matter how good yeah. you are, how much heart you have, how much sell you have. What matters is that you generally have a conviction in your, pro in your product because then your enthusiasm and your conviction is going to bubble up from inside of you. And people know, right? They know through your body language. They know through your conviction. So you have to believe in it. And with that, I might also say, don't just look for the money. Don't go, oh, I'll make so much money selling this product. Yeah. Because if you find a product that you love, uh, yeah. the, the money will follow if a couple of other things are there. But number one, you've got to have a product that you have conviction about and that you're passionate about yeah. and that solves a real problem, as you said. Sure. Number two thing that you've got to do is I would either go with a company uh -huh. um, or make sure that your manager leader can be a manager and a coach to you. What yeah. made all of the difference to me, sure, and back then I listened to audio tapes, I listened to videotapes, back then it was sure. Brian Tracy, it was Anthony Robbins, whoever it was, but it was the day-to-day -day play by play okay. that really mattered and having someone that you could bounce off of. And so okay. uh, Marcus Buckingham said it best, people don't leave companies, they leave managers. Find a and manager. The and ones and outs. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that believes in you and believes in your development. Okay. And, and I would say number three, if I was just starting out, and I talk about this in chapter four of my book, you've got to have this mantra, and that is in sales, uh -huh. no never means no. Sure. And you're going to have to deal, the more rejection you can deal with, uh -huh. the farther you're going to get. The only reason I am where I am today is because of all my sure. failures, and we could do a whole show about that but you can't let it get to you and change yeah. your physiology and, and change who you are because anybody who does anything great in life is going to have critics and people are going to say, no, you're going to forget about them. So yeah. you have to get yourself in an emotional and mental state that you have the resilience to push through. Okay. So here's what I think I heard you say. So one, find a product that you love that solves problems. You obviously want to sell something that solves problems or you're going to sell more if it solves problems and you can position it that way with the right questions. Two, you're basically, uh, once you find that product and, you, and you're passionate about it and you know that it solves problems, um, two, tell, tell us two real quick again. Recap that for you, me. You've got to have a, a mentor coach. You have to have the that, right that coach. help you play by play because otherwise sales training is theoretical. I agree. Right? You have to have somebody that can help you. Have real implement. life implications like yeah. you're doing in this podcast. Yeah. It's real life implications. So you have to implement. You have to have the right coach that knows what they're doing that can help you implement yeah. what you're learning. And then number three, you just have to learn that basically you're going to have some rejection and you just have to follow through with that. And as you learn more skills, that rejection starts to come down a little bit because it's much easier to connect with people. I love those three things. All right. Now I'm going to ask you this. Several of your trainings, you also talk about how we need to, I think you said, rehumanize the sales process. Tell us more about what that means. Well, you talked earlier, um, and everybody knows about this phenomenon that we're all in called yeah. information overload. Yeah. Um, as, a, as a quick, interesting piece, my brother shared this with me. He happens to be a neuroscientist. <laughs> he got the brains in the family. Um, and, and he told me that as a society, we've created five times as much content in the last few years than in all of humankind. We take really? in the equivalent of 175 yeah. newspapers worth of information per day. So accessing information today isn't the challenge, it's filtering it and it's the same for our customers. Right. So when we talk about rehumanizing, look, everybody has information, Alexa has information, yeah. right? I've got Alexa, she knows everything. Yeah. To make it in sales, the most important thing I'm gonna to share today, we have to be able to do everything Alexa can't do. Uh, tell us what that means. And what can Alexa never do? And we have a four part framework that we talk about. We call it the call method, pick up the damn phone, stop just emailing, particularly now. Um, but Alexa will never be able to connect to another human the way humans connect. Alexa will never be able to ask questions that break past what we call the skin through the bone and into the heart. That bring out their emotion. Of why people buy, that's right. Alexa will never listen 
not only to the words, but the emotion behind the words and get the nuances. And Alexa will never be able to take all of that information and then link it yeah. to a writer tomorrow. Well, and they'll that's never be what able every to, good salesperson does. I agree. They'll never be able to listen to what the prospect actually means, not just what they're saying. I think that's an important distinction. Because a lot of times, like you said, they'll say something, but it doesn't necessarily mean that that's what they mean until you ask really good clarifying and probing questions to pull out more emotion of what it actually means to them. Big difference in saying something compared to what that actually means or you interpreting that as a salesperson. And you're right. That will never be taken away because emotion is what triggers somebody to have urgency to want to change their situation. As you know, uh, logic is something they just justify it with at the end, but emotional decisions are how we make decisions for sure. Now, let's talk about this call method you just brought up. Connect, ask, listen, link. Why should salespeople be using that right now? Well, if they're doing it right, and I don't care what methodology you're using, if you're using spin selling, if you're using challenger sale, everybody's got a methodology, but any good salesperson has to do and does do all of yeah. these four things regardless of the wrapper of the technology. Look, sure. we know, according to Harvard Business Review, there, um, there's two things that every salesperson needs in order to create influence. And that's empathy, knowing your customer, and competency, knowing your product. And I love at seminars, Jeremy, to ask what's more important, empathy or competency? Mm -hmm. And the truth is it's a trick question. They're both equally important. Sure. In sure. fact, they make up 90% of influence, but here's the trick, the order matters. So we have to lead with empathy. Okay. Tell empathy. us why. why do we have to lead with empathy? Why, psychologically, what does that do to the other person on the end of that phone or the end of, uh, end of that room that's listening to us, talking to us? Well, think about when you go to a party or yeah. think about when somebody tries to connect with you on LinkedIn. Hey, Jeremy, <laughs> I'm Sherry. Yep, they call me six-figure Sherry. Yep, I'm the top salesperson in my company. Let me show you my awards. Let me show you my accolades. You know, it's, it's all about you, right? Yeah, it's, it's all about, about you, me. Right? This is actually yeah. having good hair. It's from my brother. <laughs> That's um, the best one. Anyway, um, but but we hate them. They're obnoxious, and and you know, we, we, they're they're repugnant. And this is true for leaders in an organization too. If you come in with all competency, um, you elicit fear in your team. Now you need to have competency. Don't get me wrong. You need to know your product. You need to know the competition. But we need to lead with empathy because empathy is the cornerstone of trust. I agree. Empathy gets you in the door. Yeah. Competency, reliability, integrity keep you there. So you have yeah. to lead with this empathy, which means it's about them. You've got to do your homework, know about your customer, yeah. um, like you did. Thank you so much for going on my YouTube. That creates trust and it shows me you're competent. Well, here and there, you know, I'm from Arkansas. So sometimes we get a few things right. But I think you said it right on the head. You, you said empathy helps the person want to engage because if we can't get them to open up you can't just go in without them being open to engage and just start peppering them with questions they're just going to shut you down so you have to know the right bridge questions you have to know the right things to say that more humanize that conversation that gets them curious enough to want to engage with us and once they start to engage with us and we ask those questions those questions make us or cause us to be viewed as someone who is competent, right? I call that, you become the trusted authority or a trusted advisor. I, I love the word trusted authority more than even advisor, right? You are the authority figure in your market, whereas most salespeople that are competing to win that business, they're viewing them as just another salesperson trying to stuff their solution down their throat. And because of that view, they treat you completely different. And that's what rises, makes you rise from just a, an average salesperson to up to this level that most salespeople only dream about it. Now, I wanna shift into this here in the last 15 minutes or so that we have, because this is very important. Let's talk a little bit about salespeople with what's going on right now. And I know your company shifted, our, our company's done this too, to focus virtual presentations more virtually, obviously virtually now because of COVID-19. How are you adjusting? Because this is gonna help salespeople, this is very important. How are you adjusting your presentations to assure that they translate through a virtual medium, but still fully engage the person on the other line. What are you doing? Yeah, well, the first thing we did um, before we told our customers what to do uh, is we researched what salespeople were doing. Okay. And we came up with the 10 biggest mistakes salespeople make 
in a virtual environment. And I don't always like to train in the negative. Yeah. Um, but can I think- Can you give us a few of those? Yeah, I, and I think particularly in this situation, you have to look at what not to do in okay. order to then go what to do. Um, right. And I call these tendencies, and I, I just wanna also say that these are default behaviors. These happen when we're lazy, when we're not paying attention. Yeah. Um, I first heard the term in my yoga class my yoga teacher always said, oh, you have a tendency to slouch. If you're not thinking about, and now wherever you are, everybody, you're gonna stand up straighter. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, you're gonna put your shoulders back, but we have these negative tendencies. Um, and actually there's a part of your brain that lights up when we're being lazy uh, and, and it creates feel good hormones. So there is a tendency towards laziness and default behavior. So okay. some of the um, 10 default behaviors that we've seen and I'll just give you three or four of them because uh, we are doing a, a very exciting uh, virtual course in the next 45 days. But one of the biggest things uh, we have to realize is that when we're virtual, mm. we automatically don't have the same level of trust. Okay. And again, I love neuroscience. Um, there's a hormone called oxytocin that's released yep. when we're in the same room. It's a feel good hormone. It's the trust hormone. Sure. And so I have to work a little bit harder. Now, the first mistake salespeople make is they don't get their customer to turn on the camera. Okay. Let me just- so they, can't, so they can't see their body language. They can't see their body language. And let me tell you this, I just read a report. Uh -huh. Customers are seven times more likely to purchase uh -huh. if they can see you and hear from you. Now, interestingly, that same report said, you don't have to see them. Yeah, That's yeah. not as critical. So yeah, your yeah. camera has to be on, but I'm telling you, if you can, get them to turn on. I think that's so true. Camera. I think that's so true. And let me give you an example. Um, so, you know, I st we started our company here three years ago, but before that, I was a professional salesperson. And in 2010, I, I think Skype had just been out a few years. Um, I, you know, I sold, uh, at that point I was selling like, um, like uh, conferences, like big wealth investing conferences that were anywhere from 30 to a hundred thousand dollars. So like big commissions, I made a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I remember going to an event that they had me there, um, in Costa Rica. And I'm like, I can't call my customers today. Um, I, I need to call them on Skype. And so I called them on Skype and I hit this little video button. It's the first time I used it. This was like 2010. Oh first time I used it, hit the video button, they hit their video on and I'm like, a whole new world opened up to me and I'm like, how have I not been using Skype for all of my calls? This was way before Zoom or maybe I didn't wow. know that. But I literally saw it and I'm like, there's so much more trust here because I am a real person in their mind rather than just a, an audio voice over the phone. And ever since that point, uh, when I was in you know, sales leadership stuff, we just changed everything where we're basically selling on Skype or Zoom, 100%. It's hardly any phone calls. If it's a phone call, the assistant's getting them to download Skype or Zoom. And just because of that shift, let alone all the, the training and stuff, that has a huge, huge, massive result in getting increased conversions and shortening the sales cycle because they're just, like you said, there's more trust. So I kind of found out the hard way. I, I love, let's keep going with that because I think it's very important. Yeah, so no, you're absolutely right. and. It seems like, Jeremy, you were way ahead of your time with that. Because, By mistake. Well, it, 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 you know, there are no mistakes, right? Um, sure. It, it, so, so you're absolutely right. So that's a big mistake. And, and there, I would say, you know, what you want to do about that is even in your confirmation, let people know it will be a video call and yeah. you can have fun with it today. It's okay if you're, you know, dogs in the background, I'm happy to show you my new puppy. You sure. know, we, we've got to just make light and make, make real of it. Um, and which is really important. Um, number two, mm. and, and this sort of is the corollary to number yeah. one, yeah. an over-reliance on technology. Tell so us about that. There will be a time, if it hasn't happened to you already, when you are on a virtual call yeah. and everything goes wrong. Sure. Everything, yeah. right? So <laughs> for whatever reason, your internet goes down, you pull up the wrong slide deck. Um, you know, it, there's a myriad of things. And I am speaking from experience when, I will tell you an embarrassing story. When COVID just happened, yeah. I was keynote speaking for the University of Dallas and there was 300 tech companies in the audience. And, sure. you know, I, 
I wanted to do really well. I spent a lot of time on this PowerPoint. Like it was the perfect slide deck, right? I even had a professional for 150 bucks a slide, you know, put wow, the, art. I mean, this was art, right? Cause I wanted to make this great impression. Okay. So you had the slide deck, you $150 a slide. What happened? So I don't know what happened because I've been on zoom for three years, but something happened and okay. I froze and I could not find the share button. So, you know, I've got like a 15 minute segment. And when you're talking to a customer, you may have seven minutes, 15. If you're lucky, you got an hour, right? If you're lucky. Um, but I just couldn't find the share button, right? And then I'm looking, and so I'm feeling like a real idiot. So I have to log out, log back in, you know, and then I am not kidding you. Mm. I pull up not only the wrong PowerPoint, but it was a video clip of me at a yoga retreat six months earlier in not the attire that one would wear to a keynote singing a song very sexy all the time I mean, we were just like it was a bunch of girlfriends having fun sure. i am absolutely like it's funny now in the telling it was so embarrassing i can't yeah. even tell you they were generous they were nice but the big lesson that i learned yeah um and i'll even give you the video for the show notes because it's oh i love that great. um now that's very authentic uh, well, I was so embarrassed. I put it out on LinkedIn and I think we got like 30,000 views or right? something the because everybody's scary. like, yeah, I've done that before. But, um, you know, so I had to make a joke of it. And, and again, yeah. maybe I lost the deal, but I didn't want to lose the lesson. And the lesson was ditch the deck. Yeah. If all fails, if you're presenting, don't be so reliant on your technology because that's competency that yeah. you can't build the relationship. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, here's, here's another question I have for you. I, I know you, you don't have a lot of time here. What, what was your greatest challenge in making this pivot to really entirely virtual right now? What was your biggest challenge? I know salespeople are going through a lot of challenges. What was yours? I would say finding the time to do everything it took to do it right. Okay. I didn't want to make it up. Yeah. So on the one hand, we must have listened to over a, a hundred virtual presentations sure. within the first week. I just divided it up, you know, amongst my team yeah. to find out what are the pitfalls. Now we've listened to over a thousand. We wanted to really know in real world. We didn't want to guess what are the pitfalls, number one. That. Yeah. Um, number two, hmm. I probably could have figured out a lot on my own, but again, going back to this growth mindset idea. I thought, who are the best people I can find yeah. to teach me? And how can I be humble enough to say, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Yeah. Maybe I've done a Zoom meeting before, but this is different. It's got to be interactive. Yeah. Um, I've got to call people that do home studios. I've got to buy uh, some equipment. Now, salespeople, you don't have to buy as much equipment. Sure. Um, but it was really having the humility to go, who are the experts? What can I learn from them? Yeah. And asking a lot of questions. And then I think um, number three, the, the other most challenging piece was then communicating to everybody that what you did live, you can't just turn on a Zoom and do virtually. It doesn't work. Yeah. I, you know, and one thing you just said there, the second point is you had to be humble enough to realize that you know, maybe you didn't know everything and you had to go out and seek expert advice and people who mainly, who, who may, who, who maybe knew more about that subject than you do. And I, I see that with salespeople. I think one of the biggest things that holds salespeople, most salespeople from being great, like salespeople make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, if not millions of dollars a year as a salesperson is their ego. Okay. They think that once they've arrived, maybe they make low six figures that they are just the best and they can't learn anymore. And you know, they can't take advice from anybody else. And that ego keeps them at the same income or less every single year because they can't make changes. You know, the, the book, Who Moved My Cheese? I read that like 20 years ago when I was in college. Um, they can't move, they can't shift. When, when things need to shift and change, they're stuck in their old ways. And because of that, they lose. What are, what are a few trends, as we end this, uh, this podcast, what are a few trends that you're noticing as a result of this shift to virtual selling? Um, the big one is yeah. right now, 90% of all sales professionals are selling virtual. Yeah. Now, here's the interesting piece. Mm. What experts are also saying 
is even after we have a vaccine, if you're listening to this later, we're in the middle of a COVID-19 pandemic, <laughs> you know, we're all wearing face masks. Um, the biggest thing is companies, businesses, and sellers are saying, you know what, this works. Of this course. Didn't work. And, and so one of the biggest trends is if you're a business owner, if you don't have a strategy for virtual, you're going to be left in the dust. Uh -huh. Sellers, if yeah, you yeah. don't know how to have the agility to sell virtually, uh, virtually as well as on site, you're going to need to because this isn't going to stop. It's going to continue. Now, win rates not, might not be as high, but you can get to more people. You can prospect. I see this like the inside sales movement. This yeah. is going to shift everything we do uh, and the way we do business and the way we live. And the good news is sellers, yeah. I believe, will have more balance in our lives, which is... I, I, I true. Yeah. I mean, I, if a company doesn't have to send you from LA to Dallas to do a demo that you could just do on Zoom, why would they spend three, four grand for the salespeople and an engineer to go do that when they can actually do the same thing on Zoom? And if they learn the right skills, be just as effective. So companies are starting to see that now. And there's a major shift, you know, like even in the city we live in, you know, people in commercial real estate, they're kind of hosed right now because a lot of companies, most of their employees are working from home and they're like, well, when everything comes back to normal, I think we're going to get rid of half of our office space because we realize we don't need everybody working from the office space. Yeah. So I would not want to be in commercial real estate right now for sure, depending on what you do. Uh, but there's a major shift going on and you're right. It's not going to go back to where insurance salespeople are just going to go into everybody's homes all the time when they could just do everything they do on a Zoom meeting. I mean, and, or whatever you sell, it doesn't really matter. Like there's a major shift going on and you have to learn some of that technology and you have to learn how to communicate. Like you said, get them on video, look at their body language, have them see you. And you're, you could sell, I, I believe even more than what you were doing before. If you learned the right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you said something else, and this leads into the next trend video. So I don't just mean video while you're on the sales call, but to prospect and to follow up. Yeah. And there's some really interesting research on that. 80% of all internet traffic by next year is going to be video. Yeah. So I'm finding right now, if even if I'm opening a conversation of, you know, whether it's a warm lead or, or whatever it is, what our team is finding is that they're, they have a 10 times higher open rate sending a video uh, yeah. than sending, you know, an email. Oh. Um, following up on a conversation, um, anything, because again, it's that human touch. You're you're a hundred percent right, and you know even in our company, before we even we have an account executive that gets on with the company for a a discovery call to see if we can help them, they'll see some videos from us to really start to become acquainted to feel here's what we here's what we do right um, here's the problems that we solve for companies like yours. We're not sure we can help you yet. We won't know until we, we find out more details from you. But they see that in video. They see, and there's trust being built before we even have a conversation. And you're right, there's a shift that's going on right now. And so if you're a salesperson, which all of you are listening to this, um, take what Sherry is saying and really start to dive into that and apply that. So Sherry, I can't thank you enough for being on today. Fellow Utahan. I love, I love my Utah, my Utah friends. Um, I have not been out to Utah since November. It was like pre COVID days, something like that. So I've got to get out there November, no, December, something like that, right before You've Christmas. You've got an open invitation, but I'm sure you'll, you'll out ski me. <laughs> I, there you go, here and there. Now, um, where can our listeners learn more about you and your company? How can they get involved? How can they learn more? Um, three ways. I'm very prolific on LinkedIn. So I, and I do put out free trainings three a week right now. So three okay. video trainings. So connect with me on LinkedIn. Okay. You can email me directly, sherry at sherrylevitin.com and find out about our upcoming event, A Party Without Pants. I love it. And Party Without Pants. It could be interesting. Takes. Yep. Because, yeah, you know, you can't see me right now, but I'm wearing my pajama bottoms. <laughs> Um, and we all are, <laughs> but uh, we, that's where we'll talk about the 10 mistakes that virtual sellers make and how to avoid them a little bit more about the call method to selling. So Sherry, S-H-A-R-I at Sherry Levitin, L-E-V-I-T-I-N.com. And then the third way is uh, buy my book on Amazon. Okay. Uh, 10 universal truths every salesperson needs. I love to. that. So I want everybody to, to write that email down. We will have that in the notes here for you. 
uh, write down her email, email you her so you can get involved in her training on virtual, the virtual shift, the virtual training. It's very, very key. The reason why I brought Sherry on right now, rather than months down the road, is because I want to prepare you for about well, what's already happened, but what is really about to happen. So that's Sherry. That's the whole reason why I brought you. I mean, you're cool and everything too, but you're an expert, especially here in this virtual shift. So Sherry, thanks for being on. Thank you, Jeremy. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, talk to you soon. I'm gonna have you back on. Now, if you're serious about joining the top 1%, I mean the top 1%, and you wanna experience more training content just like this, click the links right over there. Right over there, they're exactly what you need to see next. You see, I release new episodes featuring top salespeople and sales authorities, multiple six-figure, high six-figure, even seven-figure earners every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday every single week at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And if you're new here, do yourself a favor and smash that subscribe button right below, right below, and join our new Facebook group, Sales Revolution. You see, it's free, and there's a link in the description below just for you. We put it there for you. Finally, I make posts on Facebook and Instagram each and every day with more tips and training. So be sure and follow me and turn on your notifications. So make a comment in the first seven minutes to any of my latest posts, share this episode, and there's a very real chance that you're gonna win some killer prizes. And here's the thing, don't sit on the sidelines. Don't be like everyone else, get into the game. Join the sales revolution, stay active, get involved, Learn the right skills, and we will show you how to take your life and income to a level that most only dream about. Stay safe. Talk to you soon.